Welcome to Whole and Unleashed, a podcast about coming home to ourselves, featuring conversations with special guests on topics related, but not limited to burnout, mindset, fulfillment, transitions, wellness, and so much more. I am your host, Jessica Locke, Astrala Yoga Guide and Holistic Wellness Coach, and this podcast is not about telling you what to do. I believe we all have the answers we need within. This podcast is here to inspire you, help you find clarity, and maybe give you an extra nudge towards living wholeheartedly. And of course, we'll be sharing tools and strategies from our guests to embrace your inner wisdom and live unleashed. Ready to dive in? Electric. This is the word that comes to mind when I think of today's guest. I met Karen Gross through a mastermind, and we instantly bonded over mindset, growth, our love for Lima, and her cat Pablo, amongst many other things. Karen has a grounding presence and can transform the energy in any room. For nearly two decades, Karen lived a double life, writer by day, singer by night. She gradually realized that her two worlds were not worlds apart though the outfits might be. Both words and songs have the power to inspire, inform, connect, and comfort us. And to Karen, powerful writing and singing share the same goals. To be candid, be clear, be compelling. That's why she's passionate about communication that sings. She launched Karen Gross Enterprises in 2013 to connect and help others connect with audiences through words, songs, and speeches. She's collaborated with some of the most influential, pioneering leaders and organizations, crafting messages that resonate and get results. Before starting her own company, Karen spent over a decade as a communications manager, magazine and newspaper editor, reporter, and publicist. Simultaneously, she was also performing and studying voice, cabaret, and comedy in New York City and Philadelphia. She's been singing since she can remember and performing professionally since graduating Phi Beta Kappa from Wesleyan University. In today's episode, Karen shares her passion and love for words, her journey integrating writing and singing in a way that's aligned to her, working through imposter syndrome, why perfectionism is an illusion, on opening herself up for help and support, the power of asking and receiving, and how things are getting more interesting with age, and so much more. Come join this juicy conversation. So welcome to the Whole and Unleashed podcast. (laughs) Thank you, Jess. So happy to be here. How are you doing? (laughs) I'm great. It's Friday, and I'm so happy to wind down the week with you. This is so nice. Oh, I love it. You always have such a very calming presence. I just, you make me feel calm. I want to say thank you for that. (laughs) Well, I'm very touched by that because you always make me feel that way. And uh, I feel like usually I have more of like a hyper energy. So that's actually, I'm very touched by that compliment. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) That's good. That's good to know in here. (laughs) We help balance each other out. (laughs) Love it. So tell me a little bit about yourself. Where are you from? Sure. Well, I, um, I'm from Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Um, I know you're based in Canada, so I don't know if you're familiar with kind of where Bucks County uh, is located, but a lot of people um, know it as being sort of a respite in between Philadelphia and New York City. And it's always attracted people from both those big cities who maybe want to have a little time in the country or, um, you know, a little getaway. And so it has a bit of, you know, the country, but it also has some culture and a lot of artistic history, actually. And I'm talking so passionately about it, I guess, because I've moved back here actually about three-ish years ago after being in New York and Philadelphia and kind of living the big city life, I I sort of fled the country and um, have now returned and have fallen back in love with it. So kind of a full circle. Oh, that's nice. And you got to live in the busiest cities as well. Yeah, actually. It's so interesting how I feel like even I would walk so fast in New York, especially, and now I've you know, kind of gone a maybe a 180 and really slowed it down in a lot of ways. Though I, I guess I still have a sort of, um, you know, a drive maybe to my energy uh, that yeah. a lot of New Yorkers have. But yeah, it's been definitely a change and a, I think a, a positive one in my life. So it's good to hear. 
yeah. positive changes are always welcome. <laughs> it's true. It. It's true. Although I must admit that when I moved back here, um, I actually had a, I had a flood in my apartment in New York City. So it wasn't um, like, I want to move to the country to like change my life. It was actually a bit of a surprise. And there's my cat, Pablo, who <laughs> wants to be part of the <laughs> interview. Of the conversation. <laughs> he, um, he's really excited about this conversation and obviously happy to be in the country as well. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think he's going to settle down in a moment. But um, <laughs> he... Um, he and I were living in New York, and uh, one day there was um, obviously an unexpected flood. There was a big rainstorm in, in the city, and I was living in a basement-level apartment. And um, long story short, I ended up back here kind of unexpectedly and a little kind of freaked out about it at first because I right. couldn't, yeah, couldn't walk anywhere, couldn't go to a coffee shop around the corner, you know, this and that. And it took me a moment to adjust and appreciate um, being back in the country. And this, this, like I said, was about three or three ish years ago, maybe. But all of a sudden, um, I started to realize the blessing of that unexpected um, incident. And, you know, like mm -hmm. I also said, fell back in love with the, uh, the natural world that's here and, and the artistic world that's here. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about the moment where you realized you were moving back but then getting used to not having the convenience that we're so used to, how did it feel? It felt really challenging, to be honest, at first. Um, it was an unexpected move. And it's funny, I don't often talk about this, so I'm kind of thinking about it in real time. But um, I've learned, I think, in my life that the universe sort of forces our hand at times. Sometimes it can be very painful. Um, and this was a very challenging time to figure out where I was even going to go after I had this incident with my apartment in New York and um, wound up. And I even talked to a dear friend of mine who is a Manhattanite and a former Bucks County gal. And I said, I'm thinking of moving back to Bucks County. Am I crazy? <laughs> like, is this, you know, I think there's a little bit of a going back home kind of uh, almost like a stigma, which I think is now in retrospect, really ridiculous. <laughs> um, especially, yeah, if your home is a, a, such a, if you have the good fortune of growing up in such a special place. Um, so I think for all those reasons, I was uncertain about that. But in retrospect, now realize it was all, you know, as they say, kind of part of the plan. Um, but at the time, it felt like whiplash, really. It felt like, oh, my gosh, at first, I, you know, I lost my home, I didn't know where I was going to go. And then wound up back here and then gradually realized that it was a, a wonderful place. And I can, you know, talk more about the kind of work I did around that, you know, of, even with my own sort of personal self as an artist, um, realizing that I didn't have to be a New Yorker, you know, doing the New York singer thing to like be a hardcore artist or whatever, the whole thing around that, you know, being in New York. And that's no knock on New York because I love New York in so many ways and had such a great community there, um, especially in the singing world. And uh, there's so much I, I do miss about that and, and about the community. But um, I also feel like you don't necessarily have to be in one of those big cities to do your thing, or whatever your thing is. Yeah. Yeah. I was just going to ask you about like, what about your career and everything? Because it wasn't a matter of just relocating. It was also changing communities in a way. Absolutely. And I went to New York with the goal and the dream of really diving into the cabaret scene, um, which I had done in Philadelphia for many years and had an amazing journey um, developing as a cabaret singer and performing in Philly. And Philly was such a, has always been such a, I was born in Philly, so it's my hometown. It's also always been just such a warm and welcoming place for me. And then made the leap to New York as I continued to hone my craft and um, do more workshops there and do more performing there. And so, yeah, and I, I met just incredible teachers and fellow performers there who were just so passionate about cabaret. And um, so, yeah, I mean, it was kind of like breaking up with a, a boyfriend or something in a way when, you know, because I, I hadn't planned to be there for, you know, for just a few years. I was probably there in total for about four years. Um, and I, you know, I had a lease, an apartment, you know, I was kind of doing the thing. And so, but, you know, as, as life happens, uh, 
you, you just learn that you can go with the flow and the flow is as it's supposed to be <laughs> most of the time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So you shared a little bit about how for nearly two decades you lived a double life. You were a writer by day and singer by night. Yes. Tell me more about this. <laughs> Well, thanks for uh, for asking and for um, kind of knowing that uh, part of the journey. It's it's been kind of for many years. It was more of like a parallel journey, not an intersecting journey. I would say. So yes, I um, have always been a writer and a singer. And when I left college, um, my first job was at um, a newspaper in Bucks County. Actually, well, so. I should say that for a few years after, right after I graduated, I came back to Bucks before I moved um, to Philadelphia. So I was working in a local uh, newspaper as an editorial assistant, you know, kind of getting into the journalism world. But then at night, I would be exploring um, the clubs and learning about the singer-songwriter scene at that time. And it was just, um, it was exciting because I felt like I could kind of do both things, but um, they sort of felt like they were in their own little silo, you know, and for, for many years, I felt like a lot of people knew me as either a journalist, a writer, or as like this, you know, a singer. And um, sometimes I wouldn't necessarily want to admit that I was a writer. People knew me as a singer, if like I had, a, that I had like a day job or whatever. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and then, you know, vice versa. So but again, I also feel very grateful that I had the opportunity to do both for so many years. I would just say they weren't necessarily in conversation with one another. Some people knew. I would say some people from my writing life um, were very supportive of my music life. Um, and so it was hard to miss because sometimes I'd be at my, you know, day job writing editor, whatever I was doing, and I would literally be changing in the bathroom into my <laughs> evening <Wow>. attire. <laughs> Yeah. You know, kind of like a yeah, putting my eye makeup on and my sequins on or whatever, you know. So it was hard to, you know, but um, yeah, for a while it wasn't. I know you appreciate this, Jess. It wasn't like a holistic relationship. It was a, you know, I'm kind of this person and that person. And I know that you are um, wonderfully focused on being a whole person. And so it took me a number of years to kind of be that whole person, I would say, realizing that it's all communication. Right. Integrating both parts and realizing that they're not fighting against each other. Totally. And that's a great way to put it. I did sort of feel like they were fighting against each other because I felt like, oh, you know, I, um, I have this going on, I have that going on. And they're like almost intention, you know, mm -hmm. um, which might have been my own mindset around that. It probably was. It wasn't like people weren't supportive. It was probably my own maybe not embarrassment perhaps, or, or just, hmm, I don't want these people to know about that or this and that, but yeah, eventually I, I think I, frankly, now that I talk it out, I think it probably was my own sort of block around integrating them. But I also feel like, yeah, um, people would sometimes ask me, oh, you're a singer. Um, and then the second question to that is like, well, what do you really do? Oh, so really? Think, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot around that. I feel like for artists who have um, something that they do that people may not think is lucrative or like they don't really understand um, how you could do that, quote unquote, for a living, there's often a little bit of like a little head tilt, a little skepticism. Like, well, do you, do you really do that professionally? So perhaps also there's a little bit of my own block, but also society's expectations, I think, of artists of saying, well, you, you, you have a day job, right? <laughs> and then do you get the conflict of telling people your day job? And if you do share that you're also a singer, you feel like it might take you less seriously, like one is always outweighing the other? Does it, did it feel like that? Well, that's a great question. I think what was really always interesting to me when I would, people would say, so here's the question, right? I'm sure you, you've heard this. So what do you do? What do you do? People want to know that. What do you do? And um, if I were to say, well, I'm a singer and I'm a writer, um, which is what I still say, by the way, <laughs> to this day, um, people would um, always kind of grab onto the singer part because it was so unusual for someone to be like, well, I, I'm, that's what I do. I'm a singer. And it also seemed to light them up in a way like, oh, really? You do that? But then I feel like soon thereafter, there might be, well, 
do you know, do you do that professionally or like, how does that work? Or, you know, <laughs> but, uh, but at the same time, there was an excitement and a curiosity around it, which is something that I'm thinking about a lot in terms of helping other people now that, yeah, you actually can do something really joyful professionally. <laughs> and, yeah. you, you know, you can, that, that can be a real thing. Um, so it's, it was, it's always a very intriguing and a slightly loaded conversation. I think when an artist admits that they are serious about their art, they do it professionally. They're going to tell you this is quote unquote, what they, what they do. Um, and it's always kind of a fascinating study in what our assumptions and perceptions are, I think, of artists and making money and all of that. Yeah, that's yeah. so true. And I think anything related to art, I went into design school and mm -hmm. my parents were like, you are not going to make money. Artists don't make money. And this is a very strong and painful misconception because if you're good at your craft and it's something you believe in, there's always a way, but I, a lot of people project their fears and they think, you know, only certain jobs will take you to a career that makes you happy and bring you joy when, no, it's possible to integrate the things that you enjoy. Wow, Jess, I wish I had talked to you when I was like 24. <laughs> you just totally <laughs> nailed it. And I think there is projection that people have and, and it's, I'm not blaming people for that, you know, because I do think, like you said, there's you know, kind of an ingrained thing in a lot of um, cultures and societies that, you know, being an artist is, is risky. And, and the truth of the matter is it is. I mean, it is a hard path in a lot of ways. It's not a nine to five. It's not a traditional path in certain ways. But I think what we've all learned, especially this past year, is like, what is security really? What, what is predictable? <laughs> you know, what, what, what is, you know, everything has sort of, um, been exposed, I think, is kind of unstable in a lot of ways. So if we have this life to live, um, wouldn't it be great if everyone could follow their, their joy, you know, and, and, and even if it's less, quote unquote, traditional or, or predictable in certain ways. Um, and of course, I say that acknowledging my own privilege, I think, in my life where I, I had a lot of encouragement to do my art. I think it can be challenging depending on your circumstances, to follow things. Um, you know, I also think that there's a lot of circumstances in our society that make it challenging for people to pursue um, non-traditional paths. But I also know a lot of people who do it no matter what, and they just go for it. And I give anyone that goes for, you know, an artistic and creative path, incredible respect on many levels. Yeah, because there's extra challenges. I think sometimes not having someone believe in you is the most daunting thing ever, especially people you trust or people you care for, that can be like, oh, that's how people get discouraged from things that they actually enjoy. But like you said, there's no stability. You can be working at a nine to five job and you know, this year has shown that as stable as that job was, anything could happen. Yeah, it's, it's true and it's, you know, it's heartbreaking in a lot of ways because you know, we like to hold on to, things that we think are certain and stable, right? But yeah. life is probably not really like that. You know? <laughs> we yeah. learn as we get older, right? You know, the things we thought were just, you know, you know just solid, 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 or often, you know, maybe not as solid as we originally thought. And, and, yeah. and I think that's a good thing in a lot of ways. Life is fluid and, and we have to get, you know, comfortable with that in a lot of ways. So I think artists in particular are, are very good at, um, dealing with improvisation and uncertainty and um, listening to those larger patterns I was talking about earlier and following their intuition. So hopefully that's something artists can also help other people to get more comfortable with as well yeah. in their own lives. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's why people are so inspired and pulled by when you tell them you're a singer, because it's such a it looks like such a fulfilling path and so liberating when you're performing and burying your soul in a way. And I think people can relate and maybe wanting a little bit of that freedom. Maybe that's why they get so light up, but then their previous conditioning might be like, oh, but it's not making money or maybe not enough, whatever that means. Yeah. And I think also people think that when you're a singer or an artist that it's, um, 
glamorous and it's always about just making your art and (laughs) la-di-da. And the truth is that it takes a lot of rigor, at least cabaret does. I shouldn't speak for, you know, I'm sure every artist has their own way of working. But for me, I would really work hard on putting my shows together. I worked with a director and a musical director who were so talented and pushed me to be even, you know, better at what I was doing. And I was memorizing lyrics and rehearsing a lot. And, you know, not to say I wasn't enjoying these things, but there's a, a work that goes into it and not to mention booking your shows and, and right. getting people to your shows. So yeah, when I say that it's something that um, is taken seriously, it's, yeah, it's not just, you know, fun and games, but like you said, I think it lights people up because expression and um, bearing your soul on stage, for instance, is something that's kind of spiritual and it's, it's, it's something that really connects people. So um I love how it lights people up and I love how music lights people up. And so that's why I'm really passionate now about recognizing the role of music in our lives, even if we're not musicians, you know, even if we're not, um, we don't play an instrument. Yeah. I just feel like all of us have a story about music, I think, and what we're playing, what playlists we've got going that in that week and, you know, what music we use to like go to bed to. (laughs) Right. I want to hear about yours, Jess. I want to hear what you're listening to because I want to know what you're having. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like <a> playlist. <laughs> my playlist my uh spotify just show like your annual summary mine was right? a lot of viva latino i think you can't really tell that i'm peruvian or latina because my parents are chinese but i grew up there it's in my music that you know <laughs> that i'm latino That's so interesting i love that so much and i love that 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 part of your identity shows up in your musical choices. Like I'm curious why the music resonates for you based on your background. So that's such a great question. I think. How does it make you feel? Oh, it makes me feel almost as if I'm back home. It makes me feel alive. I want to dance. And sometimes I'm, I'm working on like a very serious project. I remember my coworkers are like, Oh, what are you listening to? You look so peaceful. And then they hear, they like pull my headphones. They're like, this is Latino. This is salsa. What is happening? I'm like, I don't know something about it. Maybe it's the nostalgic feel. Remember being at parties with my friends, celebrations that just keeps me. That's what I tune into. It's what I recognize. It's what brings me to life. I guess the, the Latino warmth that I'm used to. Mm. I love that. I love that the music conjures all that for you. Yeah. it's so powerful how music can do that, right? It can like bring us back to a certain time of our lives. You said a, a certain nostalgia. It's, it's, it's deep. <laughs> it's deep how it music can affect our deep. whole energy. Yeah. Thank you for how, sharing that. Huh, thank you for asking. Yeah. How old were you when you first started singing? I was like, I mean, I don't, it was like when I started talking, I feel almost like I couldn't actually, tell you I there's video early videos of me singing when I was very little and just loved singing and I think you know both my parents love music I um they both neither of them are like professional musicians or whatever but always have loved to sing and love music and growing up in the Philadelphia area it's a big music town sound of Philadelphia Hall and Oates Stevie Wonder was in my house growing up and uh (laughs) yeah (laughs) <laughs> you know, all that great stuff. You can't not like, right? You can't not light up and smile just like we're talking about. Oh, and yeah. by the way, as a side note, we need to talk about Peru because I had the good fortune to go to Lima at one point and you know, oh. we love Lima and the yes. vibe is awesome. And there's my Pablo cousin. as well. I think Pablo wants to go he to is. Lima with you. I swear. He just wants to get in on this. Um, on the <laughs> I love it. <laughs> oh my goodness your choice whether to edit him out or not no so, please um, I would leave him yeah. I'm allergic to cats okay. but I want cats desperately <laughs> so I'm living through you right now <laughs> oh well he clearly loves you and um as you can tell there's lots of singers in this house <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh yeah he's like don't forget about me <laughs> he's like I'm vocal too yes <laughs> Uh, So what drew you to Cabaret specifically? Um, It's a great 
It's a great uh, question because a, a lot of people aren't fully familiar with what cabaret is or have mm-hmm. even seen a cabaret show or sometimes they think it's like burlesque, which is, I would say, almost like the cousin of cabaret and also very cool um, art form and sort of like uh, similar in certain ways. But um, how I first learned about cabaret was, again, in my hometown there, or like I said, I was born in Philly, but raised in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Um, so when I say my hometown, I'm more referencing Bucks County. And in Bucks County, there's a really cute little town called New Hope. And New Hope, um, for many years, had an iconic cabaret venue called Odette's. And uh, it was always like such an exciting place. Um, a gentleman named Bob Egan w- uh, booked the room and brought cabaret stars from all over the country to this cute little town. And it was a real destination. And um, I had started my musical life um, professionally as a singer-songwriter, more in the coffeehouse circuit, which was really fun. I did that um, in the Philadelphia area in Bucks County for a couple of years. And then I knew Bob Egan through my mom because my mom used to have kind of a cafe and Bob actually would go into the cafe and get um, carrot juice. <laughs> that was like oh, his favorite carrot thing. Carrot juice. <laughs> yes, I swear. And then my mom being wonderful and always like just so supportive said to Bob one day, you know, my daughter's a singer and she should maybe do something at Odette's. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, thank you, mom, if you're listening, um, for being always amazing. And, um, he gave me an opportunity to do like a showcase night, I think at Odette's cabaret and the rest is history. Basically. I, I fell in love with the energy in that room. I love the coffee house world, but I don't know if people can't really see me right now, but I, you know, I like getting dressed up. I put on lipstick for this interview. Like I, you know, I like <laughs> putting yeah. a little glamour into the show. Yeah. And, and cabaret is a little more like that. You know, it's a little more of a theatrical experience. It's a little more of a, you know, you're going to go to a, a show and have a cocktail and it's going to be a night out, you know, and there's going to be a little razzle dazzle to it. And that was intriguing to me. And I like that I could, um, play different characters on stage, that I could do a little sassy comedy on stage. I could sing people's songs. Not only my own, I love doing originals, but I also like interpreting other people's songs that resonate with me. And the art of cabaret is to create arrangements of songs and interpret songs in ways that that maybe um, convey the song in a whole new way. So the audience, like I did a show, it was all 80s music, but it was stripped down and reinvented (laughs) called Cabaret Mm -hmm. Mixtape. Um, So you might hear a song you thought you knew, but then you're hearing it in a fresh way and maybe it it hits you a different way. So I just, I love that. And I love writing and Cabaret really showcases the lyrics of songs. You really hear the words um, because it's such an intimate environment. It's usually like 50 people in the room to a hundred people at the most. So yeah, it's a very beautiful, intimate conversation between performer and audience. And for all those reasons, I was smitten with the whole scene. Yeah, that's a great way to put it, a conversation. I was watching some of some of your online videos, uh, one of your performances, and the way you work with the energy, it's as if whatever the audience is feeling, you could transform it reflect it back at them through your performance and then it's kind of like a magical I don't know you're working with them to create this like new energy and I got that from just watching a video so I can't even imagine how a live performance would be because you're so good at picking up that energy at like you know talking to your audience it's so engaging and yeah it feels like a conversation well thank you thank you for Um, watching and and feeling that and observing that. It actually makes me a little bit emotional when you say that because, you know, it's been hard not to perform this past year, I realize. And uh, yeah, the energy in a room when you go to a show and and for me as an audience member, as well as a performer, when I go to a show, I want to cry. I want to feel moved. I want to be transported. I want to have that conversation. Even if I'm, I'm in a big venue, yeah, I've cried. I'm a crier. So, yeah, me <laughs> but, too. okay, good. We can go to shows with our Kleenex together. Yeah, no shame. Good. This is why I love you. So yeah, you know, I, we want that, right? We want to go out of the day-to-day grind and just like be moved, right? So I love that elect- electricity. I love that people are, it's, it's an event. You're going out like I said, you're, you're in a room with other people who want to have an experience, maybe have a cocktail, you're, you're, you're doing something out of the ordinary. And then 
you never know what's going to happen in live yeah. performance, right? So, you know, someone could say something crazy as you're saying, I mean, a glass could break. I've had, I kicked over a mic stand once in a show and it was like, okay, you know, so um, it's really exciting for everyone because with live performance and especially in a small room, you, you can't hide from your audience. So that's another great thing about cabaret and why I've always, I think, been drawn to it is I, I like that intimacy and that exchange that happens in real time. I think it's so powerful. And um, I think some of the best moments I've ever had in performances have been the ones where something totally unexpected <laughs> happened. And, yeah. Yeah. And, and it just went from there and the, the, the wall broke between me and the audience and it became just something we all were part of. That's beautiful. When was the last time you had a live performance? Um, wow. So the last show I did was probably at the Missioner Art Museum in Bucks County <laughs> mm -hmm. because I created a show called Bucks County as Muse uh, about why this area has been a muse for so many artists over so many years. Um, there was um, an artist colony here. They called it the New Hope you know, Art School, the Pennsylvania Impressionists. There were painters who were drawn to this area to paint it and Broadway people who would come here. Oscar Hammerstein, who was the legendary Broadway lyricist, um, lived in Bucks County and wrote Oklahoma and the Sound of Music and South Pacific, wrote those lyrics from his home here, 10 minutes, you know, from where I live. And so um, I spent some time creating a show and uh, it was just an incredible experience and it was a sold out show and really rewarding. And then um, it was like the holidays after that. And then, you know, kind of soon thereafter, things started to you know, kind of closed down. So that was probably the last like big show I did. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you also have your day job. You started your own company yes. in 2013. Tell me a little bit more about that. What motivated you to start your own company? Yes. Um, so I was um, working full time in communications up until 2013. I was in-house uh, communications manager at a museum and was also doing in that job a lot of speech writing uh, as well as copywriting and lots of communications uh, strategy and that sort of thing. And prior to that, I had been a magazine editor. I had been, as I mentioned, a, you know, a journalist in community news. Before that, I was also a publicist. So I'd done a lot of different full-time positions in communications in various capacities. And, you know, again, the universe, um, when I was in that last job, a lot of the folks that I had worked with um, had kind of moved on to some other things and um, I was starting to get asked to do some freelance work in writing and communications and for various reasons I felt like I was getting pulled to like take the leap and go out on my own as a writer and a speech writer and um, and keep singing of course <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah that just felt like the tide was turning in my job and and I was getting more freelance requests. And so I, I just felt like I couldn't kind of juggle it all. And I said, you know what? I think I'm just going to do this. And the crazy thing, again, not to be too woo-woo about this, but when I gave my two weeks notice, I counted out the days. And literally my last day of full-time work was my birthday on tw in 2013, wow. October 3rd. I was literally packing up my desk that day. So it was the start of my new life, October 3rd, yeah. 2013. Your rebirth. No joke, my rebirth. That's a great, yeah, wow. Jess, Jess, you're hired as a copywriter. <laughs> that was my rebirth day. <laughs> yes, um, and it was totally not planned. I didn't plan to give two weeks and leave on my birthday, but it was, as you it just happened. said, my rebirth. And I, I've been um, independent, had my own you know, um, LLC, my own company, communications and music uh, since then. Yeah, I love your company tagline is communication that sings. Thank Every you. Every time you share it, I'm like, ah, oh, there's something about it that just, you nail it. <laughs> well, I appreciate that because I wrote it. So. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> and you're integrating, I think what makes you great at both positions is that you understand the emotions, the feelings through song lyrics and performing, and you can put that into words. So in a way you managed to integrate that, both of these personas. I appreciate that. And I can't take full credit for 
as I, I was just gave myself credit for communication that sings, but I can't take full credit because I actually did some work with a, um, I know this sounds kind of like, I don't know, cliche, but with a branding person, you know, because a, a, I, I had done branding work for other organizations as, as a communicator, but to look at myself and my own identity and my own brand, I was like, okay, I guess I'm going to, if I'm going into business, I'm going to think about myself. And through some of that work and that coaching, that's when I sort of had the breakthrough of like, wait a minute, this is all communication. Whether I'm using words or whether I'm singing, the idea is to communicate, and as you just said, communicate with emotion and really to connect with people and connect with an audience. That's what I'm trying to do, whether I'm writing a speech or whether I'm writing copy for the web that's um, explaining what a business is doing, or if I'm writing an article for um, a magazine or um, whether I'm on stage in a cabaret venue. Um, I think the idea is to connect with an audience in a meaningful way and a candid way in a way they're not going to forget. Yeah. And so um, it was like a light bulb moment. So I, it's not like I did my own internal soul searching alone. I did seek some support on that because you can't like see yourself, I think, as well as, you know, you can with the support of someone else. So I, I, I put the, put the uh, microscope on myself. And then from that work, I came up with communication that sings as, um, as a tagline. And I have to say, I have a client who I love, she's still a client of mine, who always used to say to me, make it sing, make it sing. Mm -hmm. And I just love that. I love it. And it's a writing client. And um, that's really what you want words to do. And of course, it's you want music to do. Um, you want it to sing. You want your heart to sing. We want, we want our lives to sing. So I'm glad that the tagline's singing to you as well. <laughs> Every I'll time you say now. it, I'm like, yes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for bringing the point out that you also worked with someone to get to where you are right now. Because a lot of times we think we can figure things out ourselves or we don't need that external support because it's too daunting. Nobody knows us better than ourselves. And it's true to a degree. Sometimes you need a little bit of guidance and it's something that I'm learning. So I appreciate you for sharing that. Well, thank you. And I mean, truth be told, you and I met at a, uh, a master in a mastermind program where we're both being pushed to learn and grow and, you know, take on new challenges. So, you know, I'm, I'm so grateful to have met you as part of the Bold Abundance Mastermind and um, think that it is something that I think we should be honest about because it, again, just like creating a cabaret show might look like fun and games and glamorous and this, there's a lot of work that goes into doing all of this, you know, yeah. including starting your own business and including shifting your, um, sh shifting your career path. And you, you know this because you shifted your career path um, that it, it takes um, learning and growing and stretching. And there's other people who um, you hopefully can find along the way who can mentor you and help you and get, help you get clarity. Again, it's easy. It's easier, I think, sometimes for me to do this for someone else than it is for me to do it for myself. So I had to be humble about that and um, really accept the support and uh, and and invest in the support. A hundred percent. Everything that you just said. Same thing for me this year. I, I I'm good at branding others, helping others communicate. But when it came to myself, my own brand, it's so hard to you know flip it back to yourself. But it's also a bit more for me liberating to know that mm -hmm. I'm not expected to do it on my own I don't know why I thought I could have but asking for help and accepting it and really investing and honoring this is what I need not from a place of like I'm not enough but from a place of this is how I grow and embracing the community. I don't, I'm, I'm still learning what a community is because we moved around a lot growing up and then coming from like a completely different industry into starting my own business and wellness and you don't get this community. So yeah, learning about that. I love that. And I think that um, one thing that maybe we're not told is that we're always going to be learning and we always should be learning. You know, it doesn't end with college or, you know, it doesn't end um, when you're a certain age. 
you know, I feel like I'm, my learning has just gotten into high gear this year. That's one thing I've tried to do while we've had a little more at home time. Yeah. is like reading and learning and being part of this mastermind. And sometimes it can actually be sort of overwhelming for me because I'm, yeah, I feel like, you know, there's just so much I want to learn and ways I want to grow and we're all in this moment pivoting. And, um, but I think that I think people should know and be excited about the idea of always evolving and that, yeah, that, you know, I also find as a woman that um, things continue to get even more exciting and interesting, which is something I also feel like we weren't told like, oh, you're going to, you know, a certain age, things are going to get really lame or something, (laughs) you know, everything's going to get boring and quiet. No, by the way, I feel like um, as women, we continue to get more multifaceted and more delicious and more, (laughs) you know, more clear on the ways that we want to, you know, live our lives. So just note to any of the ladies who are listening who, um, of any age, and uh, maybe you can relate to that. I think it's so exciting that we just continue to evolve and, and, and get even closer to our passions and our hearts all the time. Yes, I love multifaceted. I think we're not two-dimensional people. Like just because you picked a career or you specialize in one thing, it shouldn't be the only thing you do. If knitting brings you joy, go for it. It doesn't have to become a career or make money, but follow your passions. Just have fun, enjoy your life a little bit. <laughs> totally. Why, why does everything have to be so painful all the time? <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> punish ourselves all the time. With Everything has to be a grind and painful. Well, actually, Jess, I need to learn this from you because I can get into that rut as well. I get a little bit too hard on myself. Oh. So I, I, I need to you know, follow you uh, and what you're doing a little more. But oh, I, I don't know if I'm the best person, but I'm learning. I'm learning to be less harsh too. Well, I'm, I'm right there with learning with you. So you're an inspiration. I just loved you. you had a beautiful Instagram post yesterday about instead of, you know, checking off everything on your to-do list, you went and took a walk and looked at the sunset. I just loved that. And I find like, especially again, now that we're all slowing down a little bit, just to take those moments to realize what's important and to take care of our bodies and our, and our souls. So thank you for that reminder. I'm glad. It, it's so... It's so, it just lights me up to know that what I'm sharing can be helped because it's kind of my internal struggles, my internal struggle of being do, 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 go, go, go all the time and not being able to turn this off and trying to balance that energy of wanting to accomplish great things and wanting to pursue your dreams, which is, mm-hmm. you know, a great passionate energy, but you also need to rest, bring your body along for the ride. And it's something I'm still learning to integrate. So (laughs) definitely, um, we're not taught so many of these important things, are we? We're not taught how to balance, you know, work and play, really. We're not taught how to like run a business. I mean, these are all things I think so many of us are trying to figure out and learn all the time, how to be, have a healthy relationship, how to like follow your passion as an, I mean, so I think we all are, like we were talking about, always having to learn and be open to learning and figuring these things out. And I think, like you said, the, the, the trick is to not beat yourself up while you're learning all these things and trying to figure them out, just not, not to get um, overwhelmed. Just take it like one step at a time as you're figuring out your own journey. Yeah, definitely. I know a little bit from your background that while you were studying communications um, and writing, you were also performing in Broadway shows. How did you balance that back then? (laughs) Oh, well, I can't say I've been on Broadway, though. Thank you for thinking I have. I I appreciate that. I was performing in New York, but thank you. I I was working with some Broadway people who are my teachers. (laughs) Maybe I'm forecasting something. <laughs> I like that. I well, I'm not going to stop that vibe. Thank you. I'll be there. Yes. I'll be Any there. Any pr- producers listening? Hello. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's so great. I appreciate that. Um, so, but definitely, it was in New York. And you know, here's a little story um, about learning and asking for what you want. Um, in that last full time job, I was really starting to get very passionate about the idea of going to New York. I was in Philly at that time still and um, asked my boss at the time, bosses, if I could work kind of partly remote from New York as I was um, 
diving into the singing world there. I think I actually was like full disclosure about all of this. And I had been at this job for a couple of years and I was working as a writer and, and frankly, writing you, you can do remote to some degree. And I, I was working really hard for them. And I think I had, you know, proven that I was very serious and they, they said yes. And they actually, I was still full time, but I think at least two or three days out of the week, I was in New York. And then the other two days I would go to my job in Philadelphia and it worked. And th thank you, job at that time for like <laughs> being awesome. And I think now we're also seeing people are getting more comfortable with remote work. But at that time, the idea of being off site for three days um, was kind of unusual. And so, um, but I think what I would say to folks who are listening is um, it's really scary to ask for what you want and kind of go after your thing. Um, but you'd be surprised how people will say yes sometimes oftentimes, more times than I even expected when you ask. And the asking can be really hard and it takes courage to say, oh, this is what I want and need in any situation, in your job, in your relationship, in your, with your family. But, uh, and, and I still struggle with the courage sometimes, but I've found that often the universe and the people you ask will be open to your request. So give it a try. Yeah, yeah you wouldn't know unless you try. Yeah. So I did manage to balance it. I can't say that it wasn't exhausting because I was taking the bus. I remember at the time back and forth from Philly and New York at the time. And it was a lot of bus time, although I would use that time as like work time. Um, but it, it's a juggling act. And I can't say that my life isn't a juggling act to do these different disciplines. Um, but I think that's kind of my personality in a way too. You know, I, I feel like I've always sort of kept a lot of balls in the air. So I think for me, my challenge is to be okay with that, but also find time for taking care of myself, sleep, you know, being grounded. Now I'm scheduling in yoga time, which I'm sure you appreciate, you know, time <laughs> that I just need to like get off the, the wheel and um, not be in my head too much. Right. Were there any moments while you were doing both things that you felt you have to give up one over the other? Absolutely. And I had people straight up tell me that, like, you can't, you gotta, you're going to have to choose one or you, you can't, you're not going to be able to be good at both or, and, and listen, maybe, who knows, maybe I would be on Broadway if I had gone full out. But I think that there's a reason why I, I didn't. And there's a reason why I kept both in my life. And the more reasons that I could even say on this, in this conversation, why? Because I think, you know, the entertainment industry is, you know, is a challenging industry. It's also an amazing industry. The writing industry has its own pluses and minuses, and I've combined them both <laughs> and seem to try to pull what I enjoy from both industries. And, um, you know, I guess in a way I'm grateful because I have, because I have both in, in this year, actually, in particular, I've been able to draw from more um, more job kind of streams and revenue streams this past year um, because I have more, um, you know, more possible things I could be doing. So I also think that, you know, if I had just gone in one industry or the other, um, I would have put all my eggs in one of those buckets. So mm -hmm. in a way, um, and it's not only for financial reasons, that's really not the point. The point is also just that I think with my personality, there's things I like on both sides that feed me in different ways. And then once I realize that it's all communication and they really are complementary rather than, as we said before, intention and fighting, um, that's when I said, wait a minute, there, there's a, a method to this madness actually, <laughs> that I like communicating through both words and music. Yeah. And, um, and you've made them work for you, which is the most important part, I think, because we, we tend to, maybe because we're not good at visualizing different opportunities and options, you've actually managed to, you know, break the mold. You don't have to be boxed into one thing solely. You can do both things and really well because you enjoy them. I, I appreciate that. You know, it's funny. I am a speech writer. That's one of the things that I do in my business. And, um, Again, I can't take full credit for this idea of breaking the mold because along the way, people have people have reminded me of that. It's not just it's my in the speechwriting world. The David Murray, who runs the Professional Speechwriters Association World Conference every year at Georgetown University in in, uh, in the U.S., um, 
he invited me in 2016 to do a presentation at the Speechwriters Conference on how to make your speeches sing <laughs> and mm. invited me to combine my world as a cabaret singer and my world as a speechwriter into a workshop. And, but he gave me the kick in the butt to do that, to be honest. And again, it was a reminder that, oh, this is, this is complimentary. And, and it was just a, a beautiful experience to do that with the speechwriting community. And um, I've, you know, I've had the honor to work with some amazing um, people as a speechwriter. And I think I bring something kind of unique to the table when I, when I work with folks, because I have had a lot of stage experience and Interestingly, a lot of speechwriters haven't, you know, they, they're more on the writer side, let's say. So when I, when I write as a speechwriter, I'm always thinking about, um, you know, what's gonna, the energy in the room going to be like, what's the audience going to be wanting to hear or not wanting to hear, um, how can these words really resonate in this particular moment? Yeah, you made it yours. Instead of fitting, trying to fit into a job, you fit the job to you. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I will take that beautiful compliment. Thank you, Jess. I am so inspired because you do both things with so much passion and love. And for a lot of people, they might find it hard to juggle, but seeing someone who can do it and not saying that it was an easy path, but doing the work and integrating it and just realizing what works, you know, how, how far to push yourself and what not to do. Thank you. And, and it's an ongoing um, journey. And as we've talked about along the way, um, I've tried to be open to receiving support and, and wisdom and pushed outside my own comfort zone when I, when I did that presentation on how to make your speeches sing. I mean, of course, I originally had the quote unquote imposter syndrome of what, what, could, I, what could I share with all these speech writers? I don't know what I'm doing. You know, like, and then you do it. And, and you do, it's, a, it's, but I think I've, I've been hearing so much lately about imposter syndrome, like how, how so many people who you think or have really have it all together are like yeah. actually freaking out. Yeah. So, you know, just again, to remind everyone that I think we're always having to sort of, or maybe some people are just confident all the time. And if you are good for you, let me know how that works. But I think otherwise, you know, we're, we're constantly pushing ourselves to, um, to our, our our greatest heights, you know, and, and to really get to share our unique story and our unique wisdom. And, and as you just said, kind of figure out what makes us unique and the path that we want to follow. And I do feel like it takes courage to follow an unconventional path, whether you have a blended career or whether you're just doing whatever you love, like you did Jess going from one career to the next. Um, I'm sure a lot of people raise their eyebrows and, you know, maybe we're worried. And I just think we all have to get used to being okay with that, that yes, yeah, some people are going to, but, but as you also said earlier, <laughs> there's some projection there, you know, that yeah. people feel like maybe they want to do that. They want to follow their hearts. So if we all maybe do a little more of, of following our hearts, maybe oh. other people will be able to follow their own hearts in their respective ways, whether it's in your career, whether it's in your relationships, whether it's just where you want to live. I found the home of my dreams when I, where I last expected it back home. <laughs> yeah, full circle. <laughs> full circle. Who would have thought? I never would have thought. Wow. Tell me a little bit about imposter syndrome. Do you, how do you deal with it or how do you manage it? Well, I think that's something you always have to deal with as you're climbing up whatever ladder you're on, you know, because if you, if you want to keep growing, if you want to keep singing and, 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 and challenging yourself in your career or, you know, um, even maybe if you're a parent, I mean, maybe pe parents think that they're, what am I doing? I don't really know. I, I think we all um, contend with self-doubt in some ways. And I think what I've learned is to just keep going. <laughs> mm -hmm. Just don't stop. It's almost like exercise. You know when things get kind of painful and uncomfortable <laughs> yeah. and you're like, I just want to quit. I just want to get off the yoga mat. I just want to stop running. I just want to like turn the other way down this hill. And I think what I've learned 
I, from exercise and how it's sometimes fun and sometimes <laughs> not so fun. It's like, if you actually push through it and just put one foot in the uh, front of the other, even if it's slow, um, it's, not, it's often worth it. You know, it's often worth it to just keep going and pushing through your fear and your discomfort. And it ends up feeling a little better as you keep going. <laughs> I hate using this exercise metaphor, but for some reason, I maybe because I did yoga today and it was excruciating like <laughs> at one point, and I was like, I just want to stop. And then I was like, after the over, I was like, I feel amazing, you know. But I think, yeah, I think in, imposter syndrome is kind of like that, where you're doubting, what do I have to share? Oh, this is really scary. This is really hard. I'm afraid. And I really think this comes up for people around singing, because I think so many people have been told, you're not a singer you can't sing, you're tone deaf, da, 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 da. And so what happens is people, they close up their throats. They don't sing at all, even if they want to. Go to a karaoke bar, you, you will see people having the best time. You get a few drinks and people and they yeah. are, right? They are having the time of their lives because they're, they've unfurled their passion for singing. And what a shame that, you know, we're taught like we're imposters if, if we haven't been trained, we're not professional singers, but I think there's a great lesson there too. It's just, just like, go, go for it, have fun, you know, and keep, keep going, just do it. Yeah. There's no perfect. There's no perfect. And that's the truth. And I think perfect is an illusion. And this is something as a perfectionist that I'm constantly trying to remind myself is that um, messy is much more interesting <laughs> and much more, <laughs> much more real. I mean, I, I, as in my job, have to correct all the typos and I have to have proofread everything and fact checked everything. So, you know, I can't be sloppy in my speech writing so much, but I do think in our lives, there is room for, um, for learning and evolving. And I, I think Melissa Griffin actually said that everything can be considered an, an experiment, a grand experiment where we're constantly um, learning as we go. Yeah, that's beautiful and so needed. <laughs> Amen. And Amen. Yeah. Oh, I feel like chills all over me. Thank you for sharing that, Karen. My goodness. Thank you for um, asking me to chat about this because honestly, I feel like I'm rarely um, in the hot seat like this. So I, <laughs> I hope I was uh, articulate and, and usually I feel like as a, as a writer in particular and as a speech writer, I'm often asking questions of other people. So I just want to say Thank you and kudos for, um, for asking me to chat with you and asking such, um, such excellent questions that really made me think about this journey in new ways. You really inspired me. So I look forward to hearing this back because I kind of want to learn from what we talked, <laughs> yeah. what we talked about. <laughs> well, I wanted to wrap this up with some closing rapid fire oh, questions. Sure. So I'm keeping you on your toes still. <laughs> Ready. What's the best compliment you've ever received? Oh, uh, what does Pablo have to say about that? Yeah, Pablo's telling you. <laughs> <laughs> the best compliment, well, I think any compliment is such a blessing and I appreciate them. I'm trying to like get better at not deflecting them. But one compliment that I received was recently, I'm organizing a new platform that celebrates women's voices and the rock star in all of us. And I asked a bunch of uh, friends, colleagues, clients to be on an advisory council to help me think about this project. And they just showed up so big for me on this advisory council. And that was a huge compliment to me. I felt like they shared their excitement about this vision and having folks that wanted to show up and support me was a huge compliment. Mm. A book that's changed your life. Okay, I'm going to confess that I am not a huge bookworm. So if I may, I might shift the question yeah. to an album that changed my life. Ooh, yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> see how I did that? Make it work for you. Make it work for you. <laughs> did you see that? All right. Yeah. That's what we do as entrepreneurs. We kind of like, oh, can we kind of just kind of this way, you know? <laughs> no rules. Um, so I would say Joni Mitchell's Court and Spark album, which I heard for the first time. I was, I think, in eighth grade, and I was in an exchange program in England, and I bought it at Tower Records so when CDs were still a thing. And um, Joni Mitchell is a poet, 
an amazing confessional singer songwriter who just changed my life in her vulnerability and her, her voice. Um, if any of you haven't heard Joni Mitchell's music, I invite you to experience it. And I have to say over this past year, turning to her music has been so healing and singing it has been so healing. So definitely discovering Joni Mitchell. I'll add it to my to do to listen list. Oh, I can't wait to hear you, how you how you feel about it. Yeah, I'm shuffling it between my Latino tracks. <laughs> oh, and I need your playlist, by the way. Yes, please. I want the Peruvian playlist. <laughs> so it makes up everything. A lot of dancing. <laughs> Por favor. Yes. <laughs> See, um, what does coming home to yourself mean? Oh, this is this is a hard one because when I think of home, I think of my physical home, which I'm so I'm so grateful to be in nature, and um. So there's that, but I also feel like there's something similar about coming home to yourself, which is that sense of peace and serenity and whatever um, makes it possible for you to feel that way, whether it's your home environment, whether it's doing what you love, whether it's being with who you love. Um, I, I feel like I come home to myself when I have that calm and inner peace and that joy and a big smile that is just you can't even help it oh I felt that (laughs) yay what do you want more of I want more of more peace in this world Mm. wow that one makes me cry I know advice for advice for younger self um as I mentioned before I would just say that it keeps getting more interesting and exciting, girl. So don't think, you know, the 20s are, you know, and that's it. You're going to keep on having a grand old time. (laughs) And uh, I don't think women get told that enough. And not to say that young women aren't fabulous and living their best lives. I just think as you continue to get older, yeah, things continue to get rich and you you get more and more self-knowledge and clarity and so just keep going it's exciting out there yes <laughs> finally where can people find you so um i invite people to check out my website which is just my name karengross.com um and you can join my email list on there and also i have a youtube page where you can check out some of my singing mm-hmm. Uh, Jess, thank you for doing that. Yeah. It's um, youtube.com backslash Karen Gross Music. Um, I do also have a Spotify page, which I just got my little year-end Spotify wrap-up, and that was exciting. Ooh. I need to add more songs, so stay tuned for that in 2021, but there's a couple things there. And um, last but not least, I should mention that um, I am going to be launching this platform where I'm going to be speaking to women and hearing about their journeys and how music has inspired and informed their journeys and that's called she rocked it and so stay tuned for she rocked it.com that's she rocked it.com in 2021 uh it's not up yet but it will be soon so excited and i have to add you sing beautifully i was just you know research slash stalking (laughs) looking through your youtube videos your spotify and i you have a beautiful voice and presence so thank you. Thank you so much. Wow. And I, 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 even to accept that compliment, we're talking about imposter syndrome and all that. Yeah. Like, I'm just going to receive that beautiful compliment. Thank you for listening. I should probably add also, um, I'm not sure when this is going to air, but you and I are doing a conversation um, at the end of this month about how to ease into the new year, which will be on Instagram Live, I guess on my Instagram, which is Karen's Tune. K-A-R-E-N-S-T-U-N-E. So you can find me on Karen's Tune as well on Instagram and find our conversation December 19th at 1 p.m. Eastern. And really excited about talking to you more. Me too. (laughs) Thank you so much, Karen. Thank you so much, Jess. This was amazing. Thank you so much for listening to the Whole and Unleashed podcast. What was your takeaway from today's conversation? Let me know in the comments or review. I would love to hear from you. Subscribe to get new episodes each week and visit wholeandunleashed.com slash podcasts for more information.